you're in for such a great treat today. Some of our favorite people in the whole world are, are with us today. Uh, we love Curvin and Candace Brewington and their children so much. They were here for years uh, as a part of our church, uh, served uh, as leaders of our youth ministry before that. Uh, as they traveled as evangelists uh, across the country, we'd bring them in regularly to speak into the life of our church. They represented our leadership college uh, across the nation. Uh, today, they serve as campus pastors at one of the greatest churches in America there in the Atlanta Metro Victory Church. And uh, man, it's just such a joy to have them back with us. Kervin's going to be preaching this morning. Candace's going to be preaching for the ladies tonight. I, I know I've had you stand several times. Could you get back up one more time? We want to honor the man of God. Hey, would you give a great big welcome home to Pastor Kervin <laughs> Brewington? Everybody love you, man of God. I love you so much. I love you. Hey, hold on. Stay on your feet. Stay on your feet because I, I feel like we need to take the next 10 seconds to open up our mouths and to give praise and honor to the reason we're in the building today. Come on. To exalt the name that is above every name. The king that is above every king. Come on, somebody. Open up your mouth and give him the praise that he is deserving of in this room. Hallelujah. 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 All right, you can be seated. You can be seated. And, uh, man, y'all look a lot better than the 9 o'clock crowd. Come on, somebody. <laughs> well, family, what an honor it is to be here with you today. Uh, as Pastor Jeff said, my name's Curvin, and uh, we, we, we hail all the way from Atlanta, Georgia. And, uh, man, we feel like we're back at home. Uh, I've, I've already had three different crawfish dishes. Um, I've, I've eaten all the Cajun food in just the past two days possible, but uh, I do want to take a minute before I even dive into this message, and I just want to take a moment to just honor uh, the man and the woman of God that he has placed over this house. I just want to say, Pastor Jeff, that I love you. Uh, I honor you. The two of you are just incredible just for who you are. And I can say today in front of every person in this room or whoever's online that I am the leader that I am today in large part because of your leadership. So I honor you, and I thank God for you. I bless both of you. So, so grateful. So grateful. Well, who's ready for the word? If you are, say, I am. I am. All right. So listen, if I could just skip all the pleasantries, let me just say today, that a scared world is in need of a fearless church. And I believe that what this church, I mean, what this world needs more than ever before is a church that is comprised of a people who have been transformed by the word of God. The Bible says not to conform to the patterns of this world, right, but to be renewed, have our minds renewed through the word of God. And I believe that what this world is in desperate need of are men and women who don't find their purpose in the pocket of a political party. They don't assess the world around them based upon societal norms and societal expectations, but everywhere they plant their feet, they do so to take up ground for the kingdom of God. That's what the world needs. So I believe tonight, or this, this afternoon, this morning rather, what is it? It's this, this morning, come on, Jesus, help me out. This morning, what we need more than anything else, man, is for a deep transformative work to be done in our hearts. We need to go back to the basics. And I wrestled with the Lord the past two days, y'all, because I had my message put together. I emailed. I, I, I was very obedient. I listened to Helene. I said, Helene, I'm going to send my notes in on Thursday like you asked me, Miss Helene. Send my notes in. I was ready. And lo and behold, yesterday, God said, no, sir. There's a fresh word I have for you to bring to my people. So today I want to bring that word. And, um, and I believe that if it's your desire to leave this place different than the way you came, how many of you know that that will happen? Well, is there anyone in this place? I don't want to leave the way I came in. I want to leave transformed by the word of God. Amen. Is that you? All right. So I want to just pick up today and dive right in bypassing every pleasantry. And I want us to look at the life of a gentleman by the name of Saul. Because when I think about Saul in Scripture, I can't think of another man or woman in the Bible that experienced a more dramatic transformation of themselves. 
Now, what we discover about this man named Saul, for those who may not be uh, well-versed in the story of the early church, Jesus came, he accomplished the mission that he came to accomplish, he laid down his life, raised his body up, he commanded the disciples to go into all the world to proclaim the goodness of God, the truth of who he is, that the kingdom is at hand, to make disciples of all men, women, boys, and girls, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Very, very clear. But in the middle of the church expanding and growing, there was this great persecution that came against the church. And in the middle of that persecution, we find this man by the name of Saul. Look at your neighbor and say, Saul. Okay, that neighbor was real stuck up. I don't know why they looked at you like that. I'm so, look at your other neighbor, say, Saul. That was better. Come on, crossroads. Be nice. We find this guy named Saul, and Saul is right at the epicenter of the persecution that's happening to the church in Jerusalem. And Saul is a guy, we find that Saul is so hell-bent on destroying the movement of the church that we find in Acts 7 that he's literally holding the coats of the men who are stoning the very first martyr of the Christian faith, a young man by the name of Stephen. In fact, in Acts chapter 8, verses 1, hey, do y'all mind if we, like, dig into the word today? Can we dig into the word? We're going line upon line, so y'all stick with me here. So starting at verse 1, it says that, Paul, that Saul approved of their killing him, speaking of Stephen. And on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. The Bible says that godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. So I want to fast forward. So he's literally doing all he can to destroy the movement of the early church in Jerusalem. And Saul, filled with this blood thirst to crush the church of Jesus, he decides, not only do I need to crush this insurrection in Jerusalem, but I'm going to go into Damascus, and I'm going to bring the persecution there to shut down this insurrection of heretics. So on the road to Damascus, how many of you know something miraculous happened? On this dusty road, here's what transpires we find in verse 3 of Acts chapter 9. It says that as Saul neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now, I want you to notice something today. As we go line upon line, precept upon precept, I want us to, to, to take just a moment. And I don't want us to do what a lot of us do regularly, which is read Scripture and bypass these little gems that we may pass over. So I want you to notice something that in this moment, whenever Jesus speaks to Saul, notice he didn't ask, Saul, why are you persecuting them? He didn't say, Saul, why are you persecuting those people? Jesus asked Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I believe it's because whenever Jesus looks at his church, he doesn't see a religion. He doesn't see a building. He doesn't even see a gathering. He sees his church as an extension of himself. The Bible refers to you and I. Not just the sons and daughters of God, but as the bride of Christ. Are y'all tracking with me? That's why I'm always amazed and dumbfounded whenever people say dumb things like this. Well, I love Jesus, but I hate the church. Like, do you realize what you're saying? That's like going to Pastor Bud. Where you at, Pastor Bud? And saying, Pastor Bud, I love you, but I can't stand your wife. Like, if you catch Pastor Bud on the wrong day, you might catch them hands. <laughs> right? And they won't be holy hands either. I, like, y'all didn't know, this brother grew up on the south side of Denham Springs. <laughs> on the south side. Don't play with that man. You hear me? So Saul is knocked off of his high horse, if you will. And in that moment, Jesus gives him a command. We find it 
continuing in verse six. Jesus says to Saul, now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. And the men traveling with Saul stood there speechless because they heard the sound but did not see anyone. And I'm here to tell you today that the same God that met Saul on that dusty road to Damascus is the same God that wants to meet you here today. And here's one thing that I know, my friend. In the years I've walked with the Lord, I know this to be true. I know that God loves you enough. I don't know who I'm speaking to in this room. God loves you enough to meet you right where you are. But hear me. But he loves you too much to leave you the way he found you. Come on, there's a transformation that God wants to do in your life. Hear me, I'm not talking about behavior modification. Some of us struggle in our relationship with God because we've been taught to follow a list of rules without having the relationship. But anytime you try to follow rules without relationship, it's only going to equal rebellion. Can I tell you, there is a transformative work that God wants to do in the lives of each and every one of us. For those who are far from God, from those who've been walking with God for maybe the past week, and believe it or not, even for us who've been walking with God for a long time, there is always a new level of influence, power, and anointing that God has for his people. And today, I don't know about you, but I want every single thing that God has for me. Come on, I want every blessing. I want every word. I want every ounce of power. I want everything that God has for me. So today, we're going to talk about what it means to live a transformed life. I want to give you four truths of a transformed life. But before I get into it, I'm going to pray because I need the Holy Spirit to help me this morning. Y'all with that? Come on, here it is. Dear Lord, help! Amen. <laughs> Here's the first truth of a transformed life. You ready for it? Here it is. You know that your life has been transformed because the goodness of God pursues the heart of man. God pursues the heart of man. You need to know that, 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 that before a life can be transformed, you have to understand that God is in passionate pursuit after you. I don't know where you've been. I don't know what you're dealing with. But nobody just stumbles into salvation. Nobody just wakes up and just one day, oh, I'm just saying, no, 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 no. We don't stumble into salvation. You see, we are lost people. And we find this to be true whenever we look at the most prolific parables that Jesus taught, right? The lost coin, uh, the lost sheep, uh, the lost son. Come on, somebody. What do they all have in common? They were all lost. They were all lost. That's why no one in this room under the sound of my voice could ever come to me and say, well, you know what, man? That one Sunday I pulled up at Crossroads Church and, brother, I found Jesus. No, friend, you did not find Jesus. I never found Jesus. Why? Because Jesus was never lost. It was you and I who were lost in our sin until Jesus found us. It was you and I who were dead in our transgression until he raised us up into newness of life. Listen, God is the pursuer of your soul. You and I are the ones being pursued. You're the apple of his eye, the object of his affection. Can I tell you, salvation is us accepting the fact that there is a good God who has a thing for broken people. And we find here that God has been pursuing Saul. And we see it later in the book of Acts where, where, where Saul tells his testimony chapters later, dozen, uh, dozens of chapters later. Saul tells this story. He recounts it. But look at what he says. He adds one little detail in there. I want to read it here. In Acts 26, 14, Saul says, And when the light shone and the voice spoke, we all fell to the ground. And I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Now, skirt, pause. Again, don't read over it too quick. Because there's two questions that I had when I studied this. And you may have the same questions. I don't know. Number one, what is a goad? And secondly, why are we kicking the thing, right? 
Well, as I studied, what I discovered is that a goad was just an ancient term for what we now call a cattle prod. Now, anyone that's ever herded cattle before, you know that a cattle prod, that goad, it, in this time frame, it was a staff. And you know, at the end of that staff, it had, had like, like, like a sharp, like a, it was a sharp instrument. And what would happen is that the farmers, when they were herding cattle, they would kind of just use it to lightly tap and poke the herd to get them mobilized in the direction that the farmer wanted them to go. But what would happen, though, is that any time they would come across a stubborn cow that didn't want to move, that didn't want to submit to the leadership of the shepherd, come on, somebody, that cow, that animal would oftentimes kick against the goad, and the goad would therefore puncture their skin and damage that animal. So what Jesus is saying to Paul in this moment, he's saying, dude, I've been in active pursuit of your heart, but yet you've been kicking against the goad. You've been pushing back. I've been seeking after you, but all you're doing is damaging and hurting yourself. And I personally believe that the thing that was poking at Saul the most was this inner conflict in his soul. I believe that there was a conflict because I don't even know there's nothing in scripture there by accident or by coincidence. I find it odd that we're introduced to Saul. The very first verse that introduces Saul is him holding the coats while this young man, Stephen, is being murdered for his faith. The Bible says that Stephen, as the rocks were being hurled upon his head, that the last thing he spoke was as he lifted his hand to head to heaven and his hands to heaven, he said, God, do not hold this sin against them. I imagine that Saul probably had nightmares hearing those words. I imagine that Saul was tormented in his soul. I mean, can you imagine this guy hell-bent on destroying the church? He's snatching babies from their mothers and sending the mothers to prison. He's splitting families and watching as men and women are persecuted and murdered for their faith. And yet, the church is still continuing to grow. The gospel's going forth. Lives are being changed. Community's happening. I imagine that Saul was tormented in his soul, wondering how could they die so well? How could they love their enemies the way that they love their enemies? How could these people believe so deeply in this lowly carpenter from Nazareth? But what I love about this encounter is that Jesus doesn't wait for Saul to get sin free and come crawling back to Jesus. No, 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 no. The Bible says that while Saul was still breathing out murderous threats, that it was there that Jesus met him. Come on, how many of you know today that God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He died for the ungodly. And I don't know about you, but I'm thankful today that while I was still in my addiction, God was faithful. That while I was still in my brokenness, that God was good. That while my marriage was struggling, that God still called me by name. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly right in the middle of this blood-stained journey. Saul encounters the very God that he was going to persecute. I've heard of this, this story, Elise Strobel. Some of you may recognize the name, some of you may not. He was a, a journalist back in the 70s, and he, is, he was a self-proclaimed staunch atheist. I don't even know what staunch means, but it sounds serious. He described himself as a staunch atheist. In fact, so much so that Carrie, what he decided to do was to take all of his data and research, and he set out on a mission to disprove the faith of the church. He set out to scientifically disprove the Christian faith. Well, lo and behold, the Bible says, if you knock on the door, guess what? It'll be opened. And after years of research and data and arguments and study, he eventually in 1978 discovered that all of his work, all of his life's work up until that moment to disprove Christianity actually did the exact opposite. And he surrendered his life to Jesus, to the lordship of the Lord and savior of the world. And guess what? This book to disprove Christianity was actually retitled A Case for Christ. And it's become one of the most best-selling books on Christian apologetics that have ever been published. Can I tell you, 
That's what transformation looks like. God did it in the life of Saul. He did it in the life of Lee Strobel. And I believe today that he wants to do it in your life as well. Because all I know is this. Listen, if you're here and if you're far from God, if you only hear one thing I say today, hear this. Hear me. That the creator of all things is in passionate pursuit of your heart. And until Jesus is enough, nothing in this world ever will be. Period. You take that to the bank. Amen? The truths of a transformed life. Not only is your heart pursued by God, but as you're being transformed, your blindness is healed by God. Come on, can we, can we get real this morning? Saul is blinded for three days. So here's what happens. Let me just paraphrase, paraphrase real quick. I'll give you all the CIV, the Curvin International Version, all right? The Lord speaks to Saul. He says, go into this town, and I'm going to tell you what you need to do next. Well, when Saul got off the ground, he was blind. The Bible says for three days that he crawled around completely blind. And so his men carry him into this town called Damascus. And while they're en route heading into the town, God speaks to another man of God in Damascus by the name of Ananias. And he tells Ananias, hey, this guy named Saul is coming into town. You probably heard of him. But... I need you to go see him, lay hands on him, and heal him of his blindness. Why? Because I have a great purpose for this man. Right? Come on, aren't you thankful that we serve a God that will go before us? He had already went before him. So we jump back into the passage. We see this moment in verse 17. It says that Ananias then went to the house and entered it, placing his hands on Saul. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, I want you to pause with me and, and just consider this. Why in the world, I always wondered this, actually, Pastor Jeff, when I would read this story throughout the years, like, like what was the significance of Saul being blinded for three days? It's kind of odd. But I believe, I personally, I believe that in that moment, what God was trying to do was to make Saul's exterior life reflect his interior life. You see, Saul, up until this moment, he was blinded to the revelation of Jesus. In fact, what is the Bible? <laughs> Saul said it later on in his ministry that the preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. So up until this moment, Saul's eyes had been blinded to the revelation of Jesus. So therefore, Jesus makes Saul's physical eyes blind like his soul was. And Saul crawls around for three days until Ananias shows up. He lays hands on him. He's healed. And verse 18 says, immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. And immediately he got up and he was baptized. I mean, can you imagine this moment? Saul, who was on a mission to persecute the church, encounters Jesus on this dusty road. He's blind for three days, only to have some random guy say, hey, Jesus told me to come pray for you, bruh. Lift your hands and close your eyes. He's prayed over, scales fall off of his eyes. Ah, that's weird, right? He's baptized, and in that moment, a transformation took place in his life. For the first time, Saul realizes, I've been persecuting the church, and I've been an enemy of this man named Jesus, but never in a million years did I know that he was actually the answer that I was looking for my whole life. In this moment, Saul's eyes had been opened. And let me tell you the truth. There are a lot of people in this world who can see physically, but they're blind spiritually. Hey, can I just be real? Can I just be real? There's a lot of people in the church who cannot fully see spiritually. Because we get so caught up with our preferences and with our agendas. Y'all ain't going to talk to me at this 11 o'clock service, but it's okay. You see, if I'm spiritually blind, listen to me, then that means whenever I look out at the world around me and when I see issues in our society and I see different people groups that may not look like me, that may not have grown up on the same side of the tracks as me, then what I'm going to do when I have dead eyes, I'm going to look at the world around me through the lens of a secular worldview. 
a worldview that is shaped by my convictions, that is shaped by my morality, my expectations, my core fears, my biases, my blind spots. Ultimately, let's call a spade a spade. We're going to look at it through the lens of my truth. But we know what the Bible says about my truth and your truth. There is no such thing. How many of you know there is only one truth that we adhere our lives to? It is the objective truth that God is alive and he rules and reigns over all creation. And in my teenage years, if I could be honest, when we're speaking about worldview, um, if I could just be real, I, I saw a lot growing up. I grew up in a very, very impoverished community. Um, a lot of my family were, you know, involved in all types of foolishness, and I don't know, I just, the culture that I grew up in, man, I just did not trust law enforcement as a young man. I didn't trust law enforcement. I just didn't. Uh, right or wrong, I did not trust law enforcement. And, uh, and I'll never forget, years later, uh, when I was saved in ministry, about 15 years uh, back, uh, I was invited out to this church out in East Texas, this tiny, tiny little town called Decab, Texas. Anyone ever heard of Decab, Texas? Exactly. One of you? Really? Make some noise. Come on, somebody. Y'all make some noise for my friend. That's incredible. No one's ever heard of Decab, Texas. A little small town, right? They don't have anything. No, no Walmart. They have a Sonic. So I'm in this, at this church, and um, I do a concert that night. Because back then I wasn't pastoring. I was just doing hip-hop music. By the way, young person, don't play yourself. I got bars, bro. Like, <laughs> I will make it rain on you, okay? You can meet me in the lobby. Um, but literally, um, I did this concert. Kids came up, responded to the gospel. God showed up, revived. It was just beautiful. So that night I told the pastor, hey, I'm going to go to Sonic and get me some chili cheese fries. And the pastor said, well, Carvin, you know, this is a small town. Uh, it's kind of late. I don't really know if you want to go out this late at night. I realize now what he was trying to say then. Let's just say there's not a lot of melanin <laughs> in Decab, Texas. So he says, I don't know if you want to. I said, nah, I'm good. I'm going to get these chili cheese fries. So I get in the car. I drive to Sonic. Before I get to Sonic, sure enough, woo! I pull over. The cop comes out to the car, son, can I get your license and registration? The whole nine, I give him all my credentials. As soon as he walks back to his car, I pause and fear comes over me. And I think to myself, oh no, my past. Why am I concerned? Here's why. Because I knew he was about to go and run my record. Now listen to me. I don't know about you, but I've been through some stuff. Come on, is there about five people in this place that you have a testimony all eight of you. Let me try it one more time. Is there anyone that's been through this life and have been through some things? I know some of y'all are real holy. I get it. Some of y'all are like, y'all ate manna for breakfast this morning. I get it. Some of y'all speak in more tongues than the United Nations. I get it. Some of y'all tiptoe in your bathwater. You walk on top of it like that. I get it. Well, not me. I've been through some stuff. <laughs> I've been through some stuff. So I knew when he went to run that record, I knew what was going to come up. I knew he was going to see armed robbery, larceny, and some other things. So I'm panicking. He comes back. He says, son, I'm going to have to open. I'm going to have to search your vehicle. Can you pop your trunk? I said, yes, sir. I'll pop the trunk. And in that moment, I'm thinking like, oh, no, not the trunk. Why? Here's why. Because back then, as an artist, I was very theatrical. Some of y'all back in some, yeah, some of y'all that's, yeah, uh, yep. I did a lot of theatrics, like, when I used to do music. And let's just say when he opened the trunk, he saw some questionable items. He found a machete, a straight jacket, and an Oprah Winfrey mask. <laughs> Don't ask, just go with it. So the cop comes back to the door, and he said, son, what are you doing out here? I said, I'm an evangelist. He said, sir, get out of the car right now. <laughs> sit down. <laughs> so I sit down on the sidewalk, and I'm like, this is horrible. This is horrible. And I'm waiting there for about five minutes, and about uh, three more cop cars pull up with their lights on. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm about to have to call this pastor and tell him I'm in jail. 
got to come bail me out. I'm sitting there like, this is crazy. So in the middle of sitting down in that moment, um, another cop car pulled up. It sped in really fast. This young officer jumped out the car. He ran over to the group of cops, and they're having a passionate conversation, very aggressive. I didn't know what was going on. So that young officer walked over to me, and he, he, he pulls me to my feet. He says, Mr. Brewington, I'm so sorry for what's happened tonight. He said, you're, gonna, you're free to go. But before you leave, I just have to let you know, you don't know who I am. But about two years ago, when I was still in high school, I was invited to this little church right down the road because they had a hip-hop artist who was doing a concert. And when I went, I gave my life to the Lord Jesus. He said, it was you that led that night. So I want to thank you. Listen. And he said, and since then, I've been married and I have a child. So if you have just a moment, would you lay hands on me and pray for my marriage? Would you pray for my children? Y'all, I put my hand on his shoulder and I begin to pray heaven down in front of that sonic. And whenever I said amen and opened up my eyes, guess what? All five of the other cops were in a half circle. And they each said, brother, will you take a minute to pray for me? Will you lift up my family? Come on, somebody. You serve a God who will take the things the enemy tried to use to destroy you, and he'll turn it around for your good. Do you hear me? This is the God we serve. I mean, a straight-up kumbaya moment. It was crazy. That's right, baby. That's right. (laughs) Now, listen. Here's what happened, though. You're like, what does that have to do with anything? Watch me. I get in my car, and I begin weeping all the way back to the pastor's house where I was staying. Why? Because, Lee, it was in that moment that God began softening my heart towards law enforcement. He began to crack away at the prejudices that I had had and grown and come to believe. So what I didn't realize then is that God was doing a work in me to prepare me for what I would have to do 10 years later. 10 years later, to be exact, was the year 2020. Do y'all remember 2020? Like some of y'all have PTSD, like like twitching a little bit. Do you remember 2020? It was a time the world fell apart. It was the time where there were race riots all in the streets. It was a season where churches were divided and people were more concerned with speaking their opinion than actually listening and seeking to understand. Communities were hurting. Leaders were confused. But because I allowed God to transform my thinking and open my spiritual eyes 10 years prior, I was able in this season of chaos to be used to build bridges instead of building walls. I was able to stand in the gap between protesters and the police. I was able to educate as well as to advocate. I was able to cry out for justice while also crying out for peace. And if we're going to be the people of God this election year, we need to fall down on our knees and we need to begin crying out to God for spiritual eyes to see the world around us through the lens of heaven and not through the lens of our own preference. We need our eyes to be opened. We have to stop drawing lines in in the political sand and throwing bombs at the other side. I refuse to be bound to the pocket of any political party. It's kingdom over everything. Hear me. We can minor and major on these these differences and these issues, but can I tell you something? The throne that God has established in in, in the fabric of eternity is built upon justice and righteousness. Both and. I know some of y'all ain't feeling this right now, but hear me. It's both and. God cares just as much about the unborn life in the womb as he does for the immigrants. It's both hands. God had to open my eyes to see. Now listen, we as a church in this hour with everything that's going on in the culture, with the sexual confusion, with a gender, gender identity crisis, we have got to be a people with spiritual eyes who can rightfully discern what is going on in the world around us. I don't care the topic. I don't care the issue. We can talk about it. P- politics, LGBTQA+, immigration, abortion, education, racism, pick one. No matter what we face, 
No matter what, no matter what's going on in the culture, every single issue, we've got to face it through the lens of the gospel. The gospel is enough. The gospel is good enough. But what about even the small moments, the day to day? I said some big stuff here, but what about the simple questions we need to look in the mirror and ask? Do I have spiritual eyes to love my neighbor that doesn't look the way I look? Am I a forgiving person? How do I view leadership in my life? Do I honor the men and the women of God that he has placed in authority over me? Or do I live my life with an Absalom spirit, always seeking to divide instead of walking in unity to see the agenda of God's kingdom go forth? I mean, are we going to look in the mirror and ask the questions or not? Because while we tiptoe around playing games with God and patty cake with the church and the world, there's a people outside of these four walls that are dying and perishing on their way to a real hell. That's why our eyes have got to be open to the fact that God has put us in this earth to be the revival that we've been praying for. You want to pray and talk about a move of God? I'm looking at a move of God right now. We've got to wake up. We've got to put our preferences to the side. My God, sometimes we got to choose people over policies. We have to be moved by compassion and not moved by our own agenda. A transformed life, hear me, a transformed life calls us to view all things through the lens of the ultimate authority, which is the infallible word of God and the gospel that Jesus gave his life for, period. Truths of a transformed life are hardest pursued by God. Your blindness is healed by God. And lastly, your past is forgiven by God. Come on, I don't know if there's anyone in this place who is thankful. Come on, you know that God's been faithful to you. He has forgiven your past. Right? Verse 3, Acts chapter 9, it says that as Saul neared Damascus on his journey... Suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. Again, we're we're circling back, but hear me. And he fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Again, don't skip over this. I want you to catch something. Do you realize that, that considering Saul's lifestyle and the horrific things that he was involved in, do you realize that it was very, it would have been fitting for Jesus to call Saul out of his name? Jesus could have easily said, Hey, Saul, you murderer, you persecutor, you violent man. But that's not what Jesus does. Jesus calls him by his name, not by his sin. He calls him by his name. And you may say today, listen, I've done this, I've done that. I've gone too far. I've made too many mistakes. There's no way God could use me or love me. There's no way. Can I tell you something? Saul was literally murdering Christians. There is nothing that you have done. You have not gone too far. There is no depth to which you can sink to where God's arm is not strong enough and long enough to reach you out of the pits of despair. You can be free today. You can be free. And I want you to know that your past does not disqualify you from God's grace. I know that to be true because Saul wrote later on in his life to the church in Ephesus. He said that because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in what? Come on, say it with your chest. He's rich in what? (laughs) Mercy. He made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in our transgressions, it is by what? It is by grace that you have been saved. And let me just tell you, I wish sometimes as Christians, we would stop coupling these incredible revelations together. Like, oh, I thank God for his mercy and grace. No, 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 no. No, God's mercy and God's grace is so powerful in and of themselves. We sometimes need to stop and really acknowledge the difference between the two. Can I tell you, God's mercy is you and I not getting what we deserved. Can I tell you, when I stood in front of that judge when I was 18 years old, facing 10 years in prison, I deserved to serve that time. I deserved worse than that, if I can be honest. But because that judge showed me mercy, I did not get what I deserved. 
And I'll never forget that judge sent me to a program called Teen Challenge where I encountered the God of my youth. And I'll never forget Caitlin. The counselor came up to me one day and he said, Kervin, do you realize what God has done for you? Jesus has taken the cross that you should have died on and he put it upon his own back. And y'all, to know that I was given a second chance, that was more than enough. To know that Jesus took the sin and took the punishment for my sin upon himself and let me, let, let me go scot-free. How, how many of you all would be thankful just for that? Just the mercy alone. Just the mercy alone. But do you want to know what changed my life? It wasn't just the, the story of his mercy. But when that counselor then said, but Kervin, the beautiful thing about the gospel is not only did Jesus take your cross, but he in turn gave you his crown. You see, grace, grace is whenever we get that which we don't deserve. And Jesus in his loving kindness, because on a cross 2,000 years ago, he laid down his life. And today I'm able to walk in newness of life. I'm able to wake up every morning with mercies that are renewed. I'm able to live my life empowered by his grace. It's unmerited. It's undeserved. I don't care if you've been serving God your whole life. You will never reach a point in your life where you've just arrived. The grace of God is what has kept you, is what has sustained you, is what will keep you for the months and years to come. Hear me. Grace is proof that God is way better at forgiving than you and I could ever be at sinning. And I know this to be true firsthand. Because ever since I gave my life to the Lord two decades ago, it hasn't been an easy journey. I've had highs. I've had lows. I've missed the mark many times. And I've given God every stinking reason alive to give up on me. And I'm here to tell you today that he's never chosen one of those reasons. His grace has kept me, and he will continue to keep me, and he will continue to keep you. Amen. Your past is forgiven by God. And the last truth of a transformed life, here it is. Your future is prepared by God. Your future is prepared. Listen, your past does not dictate nor does it determine your future. It is not. And we struggle with this. Some of you even right now, you're thinking to yourself, I've done too much. I've gone too far. There's no way God could use me. There's no way God could love me. But can I tell you tonight that God has a way of taking the broken things of this world and using them to create something beautiful. Hear me. I, I remember being in Teen Challenge in recovery as a young man. And I just, I was just blown away again by the fact, not just that God could forgive me and, 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 and give me a clean start, a fresh start, a new beginning. But it was the fact that God then wanted to take the broken pieces of my life and use it for his glory. It changed everything. And I want you to know tonight that past defeats do not disqualify you from future victories. And we find that to be true in the life of Saul. Why? Because, spoiler alert, Saul continues growing in his journey with Jesus. He continues sharing the gospel and preaching the gospel. Saul is actually the guy that ends up becoming the apostle Paul. Paul is the guy who wrote the majority of the New Testament. And I don't know about you, but I am so thankful that Paul didn't tell Jesus, I've gone too far and you can't use me. I'm glad he didn't take that approach. But look at him. Verse 19 of Acts chapter 9. After Ananias prayed for him, the scales fell off his eyes when his eyes were open. It says that Saul got up and he was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. And Saul spent Several days. Somebody say several days. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. And at once, he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I find it funny. The Bible says that God sat Saul down for several days before sending him into the mission field. 
Listen to me. God set Saul for three days. Some of us have been sitting on the sidelines for three years. Some of us have just been sitting back and allowing everyone else around us to do the work that you and I were called to do. Well, I'm going to let them sing because they sound great. I don't. Well, I'm just going to let Pastor Jeff preach, and I'm just going to show up and get fed for the whole week. And I'm going to starve myself Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday until I come back. We let other people lead small groups and join small groups. Let other people do, do community outreach. But, you know, I'm just going to show up and I'm just going to consume instead of contribute. Can I tell you, my friend, hear me. God didn't save you to sit you. God saved you to send you. He saved you to send you. And for us, we, have, we do such a good job of making up all the excuses why we can't do the things that God has called us to do. Come on, does anyone have a list of excuses? I got some. Well, Lord, I don't sing like her. I ain't got them vocals like Megan. What? I can't teach. I can't lead. I don't really know that much scripture. I just got saved yesterday. I was just arguing with my kids this morning. I wanted to fight the guy in the parking lot today. <laughs> Right? I got ugly toes, Jesus. <laughs> we will make up every excuse in the book to not fulfill the mandate that God put us in this earth to carry out. But can I tell you today, God doesn't call those who are qualified. God qualifies those that he calls. Hear me, church. Listen to me. If he's called you to it, whatever it is, if he's called you to it, he's already equipped you for it. And we've just got to be a people who stop sitting back on the sidelines, watching the world go by, just doing church when God has placed us in this earth to be the church. We got to get to work. So what does that look like? Do you want to know? Well, I'm glad you asked. That means some of us need to join a small group. Not a small group. Yes, a small group. All my introverts say, oh, no. No, no, get in the small group. Why? Because circles are better than rows. In the words of the late, great Paul Burke, circles are greater than rows. Community, life change happens in community. For some of you in this season, God may be calling you to go on a missions trip, to see the world outside of just the Western world concept. For some of us, God is calling you to go through next steps. You've been sitting and attending and not really stepping into the water, but maybe going to next steps. Next weekend is the step God is calling you to. I, I don't want to waste time going through all of these possible steps for you, but I know this much. Here's what I know to be true. I know that as long as there is breath in our body, everything we say do every movement, every action, every intention, everything should be centered around the sole purpose of pointing men and women to Jesus. And the story that you think may disqualify you from being used by God just may be the very key to open up a door for someone else to come to know him. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? You may say today, well, I don't got a testimony like that. I never did drugs. I drive a minivan and I pay my taxes on time. That's great. But can I tell you something? The greatest testimony is not that you had to go through hell and high water to come to Jesus. The greatest testimony that anyone in this room could have is the testimony that I pray my babies have when they're older. That is not to say that they had to get high, that they had to get drunk, that they had to go out partying, that they had to hit the end of the road to come back. No, the greatest testimony that anyone could have is that I gave Jesus my yes, and by his grace, he kept me, he preserved me. It wasn't a perfect journey, but I gave him my yes, and he's brought me this far. And if he's brought you this far, he's not going to leave you here. So how do we respond? How do we respond? There's this man by the name of John Newton in the 1700s. As I close, as a guest speaker, you know, we get two fake closes, right? This is my fake close, the first one. John Newton in the 1700s, he was a... Uh, 
He was the captain of a slave ship, very well known. And uh, this man would transport kidnapped souls, people, men, women, and children from the continent of Africa and would ship them over into the colonies. I mean, let's just call it what it is. I mean, the worst of the worst, profiting off of the life of, of innocent people. And um, this man did this for many, many years. And then one day, something changed. He was introduced to the gospel of Jesus. And he surrendered his life to his lordship. And history tells us that not only did he repent and walk away from the industry that he was involved in, but he actually went to Bible college, became a pastor. He became an abolitionist fighting against the slavery movement that had, that had employed him for many years. He became a voice of freedom and of grace. And near the end of his life, he sat down at a piano. And he began to write lyrics to a song that we all know, that we probably all don't know the backstory to. But he began to write a song about how wretched of a man he was and how he was once blind until he met Jesus and was able to see. The name of that song is Amazing Grace. And we sing it as this beautiful offering to the Lord. But can I tell you, that song was written from a place of pain. It was written from a man who had been through some stuff. But by the grace of God who had lifted him up from the pits, he knew that this message, this glorious gospel was too much. It was too good to just keep to himself. And I'm here to tell you today that everything God's done in your life, everything that you've walked through, the good, the bad, and the ugly, when placed in the hands of a supernatural God, come on, he can make beauty out of brokenness. He can turn your mess into a message. Do you believe that today? So my desire today is this. I mean, I wish I had some great, awesome story to make everyone shout and scream right here at the end. I don't. I don't think that's what we, re we really need in this hour. I think what the world needs is a body of believers, believers who are vigilant and sober-minded with the formation that is planned. They come hell or high water, they're unshakable, they're unmovable, planted like trees by the streams of still waters. On mission, knowing that there's a world that God has called us to reach. And if we don't go, my friend, who will? If we're not the hand of compassion to the broken world around us, who will be? If we don't put our preferences and our agendas aside, then how will we ever have room for the kingdom to actually come? If we don't, if we don't, if we don't find the spiritual maturity to discern where we should or should not be placing all of our energy, rather than placing it in dissension and placing it in judgment. Come on, you can't judge the next man. You don't know their journey. We don't know what the next person's. If we would just take all of the energy that we put into all of the nonsense and foolishness and would just focus it to following the heart of God, to leaning into him, to being obedient to his spirits. Come on. It doesn't matter what's going on around us. And we could put all of that energy and time and focus, dedication and affection and to the lover of our souls, then I believe that we will see the revival that we pray about. I believe that we will see the revival that we talk about. I believe that we will see the move of God that every single Sunday that we sing about. I believe that we can see the city transformed. I believe that our greater, greatest years are still in front of us. I believe in my heart, even as, I, I, even as we drove into Louisiana, I feel that God is not done with this state. God is not done with this city. There are still greater things to be done in Acadiana. 
So let's stop talking about the move of God. Let's stop praying for the move of God. Let's stop singing about the move of God and let's get off of our butts and let's actually be the move of God in the earth. Let's be his hands and his feet. Let's be the heart of God to the hurting, to the disenfranchised. Let's be the voice of reason, the voice of hope. Let's be the light in the darkness. Let's be the light to those who are dying. Let's rise up and be the ones that God has called us to be. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If everyone would stand up on your feet right where you're at, I'm done. I'm done. This is my real close right here. I'm done. When every hand lifted across this room, every eye closed, if you're here today, and if you would say, God, I'm here and I give you my yes, it doesn't matter what your past may have looked like, it doesn't matter the mistakes that you've made, hear me. I believe in this room right now, here, here's what I feel in my spirit. I feel like in, in this room that there are some individuals here, I thank God for the new Christians, the young Christians just trying to figure this thing out, but I believe today that this word is just as much as for the infant Christian as it is for the Christian that's been walking with God for 40 years. Because if we're not careful, we can get so busy doing the work of the Lord that we forget about the Lord of the work. So my prayer today is that if you're here today, no matter where you've been saved for a few minutes or your whole life, would you lift your hands and say, God, I don't care what I've been taught, what I've learned, my experience. I lay it all down at the feet of the cross. And I want your eyes, God. I want the eyes of heaven, Father. I want the perspective of heaven. I want to see people the way you see people. I want to love people the way that you love people. So that's our cry today, God. So I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will do what only you can do in the lives of your people. I pray, God, that you would awaken our hearts, Lord, to see you for who you are and to see the world around us the way that you see them. God, we're not bound to any party. We're not bound to any ideology. We preach Christ and Christ crucified because the gospel of Jesus is enough. The gospel is enough. The gospel of Jesus is enough. And if you believe it, open up your mouth and shout to the Lord in this place if you love him. Hallelujah. Come on, give him a shout in this room if you love him. Hallelujah.